is so, so good. I cannot tell you. Um, and, you know, just hearing that song, which I love so much. I was with Chris Tomlin in Madison Square Garden. He had asked if I would pray. He was doing a concert there. And after I prayed, he did that song. And I just got goosebumps because it really speaks so well of our God and our trust in him that regardless of what we go through, indeed, out of the ashes, we rise. And God speaks light into the darkness. He shines. And it is so true, especially for you. I, I, I just, um, well, look, let's pray, then we'll talk. <laughs> let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for an incredible illustration of perseverance in the face of difficulty and storms. Thank you for City Harvest being that model from which so many can learn of what it is to be strong in the face of adversity. Thank you for the anointing on the, this church, the ministry that you've called it to, the future that you have planned for it. Indeed, O oh Lord, thank you for establishing, planting, rooting, and grounding this ministry to exemplify your kingdom. And thank you that no matter what happens in life, we know that you are always in control. And you will use everything, everything, because you love us unconditionally, you love us sacrificially, you love us redemptively, and you'll take everything and turn it for our good. So we love you, we appreciate you so much, and tonight we open our hearts. Speak, Lord. Speak a word into our hearts and bring us your peace that passes all understanding. We ask and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, I've got my iPhone 6. I didn't, 6 Plus. Not 6 Plus S yet. Just trying to be convinced that I need the S. Um, and hopefully technology will work because, you know, when you update, sometimes it acts up. But we're good. We're good. I hid the word in my heart just in case my iPhone failed. All right? I have chosen, and I use the word chosen because that's what it really is, to be a friend and brother. I am a brother by the blood of Jesus Christ to Pastor Kong, Pastor Sun, to the leadership and to City Harvest Church, but I'm a friend by choice. A friend is someone that you love, you enjoy being with them. There's a mutual sharing of affection, values, sense of purpose. There's a camaraderie that comes out of it. A friend is also someone that you can count on for support. That even when they don't have words, their presence speaks louder than any words that they can offer sometimes. God gives us leadership, stewardship, and relationship. And those are the responsibilities that we have in life. And he gives us people in our lives for the different seasons in our lives. And some people are there only for a season, but some people are there throughout your entire life. But I want to highlight a passage, and this is not 
my message, but it is my message. All right, the introduction maybe. Or maybe you're getting two messages. But Proverbs, I'm thinking out loud. But Proverbs 17:17 17, 17, in the New King James Version reminds us of what a friend and brother he is. And it says so beautifully, a friend loves at all times. Not just when things are going great. Not just when there are no conflicts. Not just in sunny weather. But in all kinds of weather, in all kinds of circumstances, you can count on a friend to be there. I have a few friends because not too many people fit the category of friend. And I take the word friend seriously because the friends in my life are people I know I can count on no matter what. And even if I mess up, even if I make wrong choices. A friend doesn't abandon me. A friend is there because a friend loves at all times. Second part of that passage, it says so beautifully, we can put it back, and a brother, and a brother moves from the level of friendship to a much deeper relationship because a brother is someone who is bonded to you. It is a blood relationship where there's a shared DNA. So it goes even deeper than friendship. And interesting, the passage says that a friend loves at all time, but a brother is born for the day of adversity. Wow. In other words, there are people that God places in your life at times that you're going to face some very difficult things and they are going to be attached to you in a very deep and profound way as though you share the same blood, the same DNA. So I want to publicly affirm my friendship with Pastor Kong, son, your leadership, and this ministry. And I want to affirm my brotherhood that for this season, even though it's been 16 years that I've been coming here, but especially for this season, I'm your brother. There are people who will abandon you at times like this because they want to protect their reputation. But if your reputation is intact and filled with integrity, you don't have to worry about that reputation being tarnished. In fact, you bring a level of credibility and integrity to everyone that you're in relationship with. So City Harvest, you heard Pastor Kong say that for you this is the close of a chapter in the life of this church, the close of a season. For him, he still has difficult days ahead and he needs your prayers, your support. And I will tell you that the greatest thing that you can do for him is to love what he loves. And he loves this church. Love this church and you'll demonstrate your greatest love for him. Come on, let's give your leadership a round of applause and appreciation. Hallelujah. Now, John chapter 16. 
John chapter 16, verse 33. The Gospel of John was written primarily to express the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John sees Christ as God. It opens with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And it goes down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John speaks of a very deep and profound intimacy between Jesus and his disciples. In fact, the night that Jesus was betrayed and he revealed that to his disciples gathered in the upper room at the Passover, they all looked at John to question if he knew who Jesus was talking about. And that's because of the closeness of that relationship between them. Even Peter became a little jealous because Jesus expressed a certain love for John, a certain level of love for John, that he would use John in a greater way to bring revelation of himself. So it was John who recorded the bulk of the conversation between Jesus and his disciples on the night of intimacy in the upper room where they would celebrate, celebrate Passover, which they were used to as a Jewish tradition that pointed back to the exodus from Egypt. But that night they would celebrate it in a very different way. Because no longer would there be this Passover lamb that they understood. Jesus himself would be that Passover lamb. So it was very deep. It was very intimate. And, and when he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He was expressing what he was about to go through. Something that he didn't look forward to. That would be a terrible beating hanging on that cross. He said, this is my blood, the New Testament in my blood, which was the requirement that blood would be shed so that the remission of sins could take place. It was very intimate because he was already feeling the pain that was ahead of him. He knew also that these very men that he was talking to would abandon him that very night. But this was his last opportunity before his death and his resurrection to speak into the lives of these men who would take his message forward, who would carry his mission out into the world and out into the future. So in chapter 13, he does something to demonstrate the attitude that they should have towards each other. He bows down and he washes the disciples' feet. Peter is shocked and says, no, 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 I should be washing your feet. And Jesus explains, no, I'm demonstrating something here that you need to see and understand. And that is that their attitude towards each other should be an attitude of service and humility. And just like he humbled himself to them, they should humble themselves to each other. He continued 
to reassure them that although he would physically leave them, he would not abandon them. He would not leave them totally on their own. But he would introduce the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would come and literally take his place amongst them. So that the same comfort and love and direction and guidance and insight and understanding that he gave them, the Holy Spirit would now take that role in their life. They would not be left alone. He talked to them about the relationship that they would have with him in ministry. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So understand that apart from me, you can do nothing. So you must stay in me, you must stay attached to me, no matter how hard things get. He said, in fact, that every branch in me that bears fruit, I will purge it. I will take it through a process of cutting away those things that are unproductive so that it can be more productive, bear more fruit. He talked to them about answered prayer. And he said, prior to this, you haven't used my name, my authority, our relationship in prayer. But from now on, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it for you. He said to them that the Father loves you just as much as he loves me. He said to them that when the Holy Spirit comes, that he would bring all things to their remembrance. He will speak to them historically and give historical accuracy so that we have today the Gospels. That he would speak of things to come. He would speak to them prophetically. That he would lead them and guide them into all truth. And that he would never leave them. That he would never forsake them. This was a very intimate time with these men. And by the time he gets to chapter 16, he begins to speak to them about things that will be ahead of them because of their relationship with him and because they would represent him to the world. He said, you're going to come before governors and kings and you will have the opportunity to bear witness of me. There'll be those who misunderstand you and as a result think that persecuting you is actually doing the work of God. He said, you're going to deal with persecution, trials, tribulation. He said, but you're in good company because you're going through what I have gone through. In John 17, he then prays. And he says, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but in the world, keep them, protect them from the evil one. He said, I pray not only for these but I pray for all of those who will believe on me because of their word. That's us. That's all of believers throughout history up to this point in time and to come. So that conversation was intimate and he was pouring into them in preparation of his absence because he would now entrust this ministry into the care of the stewardship responsibility of these men. And he trusted 
that they would take it out into the future and that they would be the foundation upon which the church would be built. So this was a very, very important time. And in spite of the fact that he himself was dealing with the death that he would face on the cross, those feelings, those personal feelings were suppressed just so that he could speak a word of encouragement and strength to those who would carry the message. So when it gets down to verse 33 in chapter 16, because chapter 16 opens up with him telling them what they're going to go through, verse 33 becomes a very powerful lesson for them. But let me expand a bit. Can I? I was going to do it anyway, but it's nice to have your permission. I'm going to speed up a little bit because we only have till midnight. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Good. <laughs> Jesus spoke of tribulation in two ways. He spoke of tribulation in two ways. He spoke of tribulation as a period of time that would be in the future of human history. He attached the word great to it. It is spoken in Matthew 24. Luke 21, and in the book of Revelation. And we know it today as the great tribulation. So he differentiated the words and how he used them. So when he spoke of great tribulation, he was speaking of a period of time in the future of human history that we would see unprecedented turmoil and conflict in the world. Not only that, he said that during this period of time, the nation of Israel would experience unprecedented violence against it by surrounding nations and confederacies that want to take the land. And the reason is because Israel, as spoken by the prophet Daniel, the prophet Jeremiah, Israel will experience a period of great prosperity. Number one, they would be regathered as a nation. We witnessed that in 1948. And Bible scholars had to rearrange their commentaries because they never expected that such a thing would literally take place. But you see, all of the prophecies that spoke of the first coming of Jesus were literally fulfilled. So why won't his second coming be literally fulfilled? But the nation would experience a time of unprecedented wealth and prosperity. And as a result of that, even more so, certain surrounding nations would desire to claim the land of Israel. This would lead to a pending conflict that will be put on hold because a Middle Eastern leader that will be trusted by Israel and trusted by the Arab nations will emerge and broker a peace agreement that would put that on hold and take the nation of Israel into a short period of great wealth 
and prosperity and many Jews will return to the homeland to develop this prosperity. Last, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, an, an oil and gas company found in the Golan Heights the richest deposit of oil in the world. Most oil reserves are about 20 to 30 meters thick. This oil reserve found in the Golan Heights was 350 meters thick. Ten times the average oil reserve finding in the world. I guarantee you that there will be other discoveries and the nation of Israel will rise to great wealth in natural resources that will rival the other oil producing nations. And it's going to affect the balance of power politically and economically in the region. It's also going to provoke others to jealousy. As far north as Russia, we will see some of these things happen. Now, when the conflict reaches critical mass, I don't plan to be here. There's something called the rapture. But this is what the prophetic word says. The prophet Jeremiah called it the time of Jacob's trouble, Jacob being Israel. Daniel called it a time when we would see, the Jews would see the abomination of desolation, the desecration in the temple and worship. Enough said about that. You can study that on your own. But this is that period that Jesus referred to when he used the term great tribulation. The second way in which he used it and relative to the context of John 16 is he used the word tribulation to express suffering and affliction that not only the disciples would experience, but suffering and affliction that is common to all human beings. And let me interject something here because it's very important that we are scripturally accurate and our theological understanding is refined because there are people that think that when they experience sickness and disease, setbacks in life, physical stress, mental, emotional stress, especially when it comes to some physical ailment, and I've heard Christians say this, that I'm just bearing my cross. That's wrong. Because if that's true, then people who don't know Jesus are bearing the cross of Jesus. Because everybody gets sick. Everybody has physical, mental, emotional stress. The only cross that we bear is that persecution we experience because of our public identification with Jesus. But this tribulation of which he's speaking here was that suffering, that affliction, that conflict, that affliction that we experience as human beings. You see, through conversion, Jesus made us a part of a new ideal in eternity. But he left us here to live in the context of time, space, and human experience. So even as believers, we experience the same suffering, the same afflictions that sinners experience. And for someone to say, well, once you become a Christian, all these things go away, is absolutely wrong. 
That's not true. We deal with it differently because we're Christians. We see the hand and favor of God intervene in those situations because we're Christians. Amen? We have the guidance of the Holy Spirit because we're Christians. So we don't face those challenges the way unbelievers do. But we still face them. That's a reality. So Jesus wants to make sure that these men who are going to now carry his message and take the vision forward do not fall under the misconception that everything is going to be fine because they're doing God's work. When in essence, they're going to go through trials and tribulations. They're going to go through emotional challenges, physical stress, mental stress, and it will come from various directions. It can come from family pressure. It can come from neighbor pressure, pressure on the job with colleagues. It comes from peer pressure. Got it? That's the reality of our experience. How many have experienced pressure since you've been a Christian? Every hand should be up. All right? If your hand's not up, I will pray for you for lying. <laughs> we all go through it. We all experience. It comes our way. But we handle it differently. And this is so important. In Job, so beautifully, in fact, let me give you the text. It's such a powerful text that we can get it up on the screen in the book of Job. And how many of you have ever read the book of Job? Yeah. That's the only, you read that book and you leave happy because you weren't Job. <laughs> but in the book of Job, Job experiences this tribulation that is a general reference to pressure and affliction, physical, mental, social, economic distress. He loses his family, he loses his wealth, he loses his health, and his so-called friends are trying to convince him that he did something wrong, and that's why he's going through all the things that he was going through. Those are not the kind of friends you need when you're in challenging circumstances. Amen? But Job says something in Job chapter 14. If we could turn to it, Job chapter 14, verse 1. Job 14, verse 1. And it speaks of a truth, a reality, that man, and the, and the term man is generally speaking, men and women, female, man that is what? Born of a, born of woman. Anybody in here born of woman? Okay. You know, we have to ask that question because they're working on born of man, but... We'll leave that alone. That's another cultural thing that's right before. But notice it says, man who is born of woman is a few days. Yes, against the backdrop of time, our life here on this planet is very short. We're living longer now because of medical and technological advances. But 70, 80, even 90 years is still a short period of time when placed against the backdrop of thousands of years of human history. We are here for just a few days. And unfortunately, although we experience great times and we, live by, we walk by faith and not by sight and we keep a positive attitude, the reality is that our life is also filled with a lot of trouble. So Job was expressing a reality of life. It wasn't a negative confession. It was a reality of life. That man that is born of woman is a few days and full of what? Trouble. That's a reality. And of course, Jesus again, speaking to his disciples to let them know that just because they were representing him, they would still experience the pressures that are common to human life and human existence. But let's go to verse 33. Jesus says, 
these things, and, and, and this is everything that he's been speaking to them from chapter 13, 14, 15, and now chapter 16, where he's telling them and preparing them for the tough times ahead. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me, where? Come on, where? Where? I can't hear, I need more, ten, more than 10 people to join me here tonight. That where? In me. If any man be in Christ, right? So in Christ is a position and an experience and a condition. Got it? He said, these things I've spoken to you, I've told you all of this, so that in me you may have what? You may have what? I can't hear you. Come on, City Harvest. You may have what? Peace. Peace. Right. You got to talk back to me. This is dialogue, not monologue. You may have peace. Then he continues and he says, in the world, you will have what? You will have what? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that was a promise. You may not like it, but that was a promise. You know, when we think of the promises of God, we only want the positive stuff. No, he promised you some negative things. This was one of them. So Jesus is saying, I promise you, in the world, in the social order, you're going to experience tribulation. You're going to experience physical, mental, economic, sometimes political, Stress and pressure. And it can come from so many different directions. But this is the reality that you're going to have to deal with. And the only place that you'll find peace is in me. You will not. Another thing that this, this passage is saying, please leave it there. Another thing that this passage is saying, that the peace, the world rather, cannot give you genuine peace. It's not there. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. But in me, you will have peace. Now, that's powerful because it says of Jesus that he is the prince of peace. We're about to celebrate Christmas holiday. And turn to your neighbor and say, he's almost finished the introduction. <laughs> We're about to celebrate the Christmas holiday. And one of the passages, you know, from Isaiah, you know, unto us a, uh, a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulders, you know, and then titles of Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Wonderful, Counselor, right? But another passage that we hear of, and we see it on Christmas cards, is what is stated when Jesus is seen in the manger. It says, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. The better translation of that in the more accurate transcripts, because the King James was a Texas Receptus, and King James is what I just quoted to you, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The actual, more accurate translation of that passage is peace on earth amongst men of goodwill. Because you can only have peace when men of goodwill are at the table. If you are at a table and there is someone there who has ill will, no matter what agreement you come to, it is not legitimate peace. So when nations sit down and have these meetings, it's like David said in Psalm 55, his words were as smooth as butter, but war was in his heart. So if there's ill will and war in someone's heart, whatever agreement has come to is not a legitimate agreement towards peace. It is simply putting conflict on hold. But it's not genuine peace. And in this world, since the time of Cain, 
we have conflict around the world because of competing human interests. Competing human interests. And boy, we could spend some time on that, but not today. So Jesus says, in me, you will have what? Peace. He continues. Let's get the verse up there again. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. I will tell you the first time I read that, and I read, I read, tribulation, be of good cheer. Ah, because I've overcome the world. And I'm saying, you overcame it. What's that got to do with me? And I realized that because he overcame it, my faith in him makes me an overcomer because I'm in him experiencing this peace. And it's the only place that I can find peace. So anything that the world offers you that claims to give you peace cannot give you peace. Turn to your neighbor say, neighbor, only God can give you the peace that passes all understanding. Amen? Amen. Now, let's, let's understand this a little bit. In Isaiah, ooh, 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Look at it. You will keep him in perfect, what? Peace. And perfect means whole, complete. You will keep him in perfect, what? Peace. Whose mind is kept, where? Is stayed on you because he trusts in you, and that you, of course, is God. Look at it again. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And I will tell you, when you are in turmoil and there's conflict and stress, your mind can be filled with everything but God. And you have to discipline yourself to get all of the fog created by all of these things that are coming at you. Because the battle of faith is really the battle that takes place in your mind. That's the battlefield of faith. And these other things come to flood your thinking. And if you don't focus on God, then you won't experience that peace. Because your mind has to be focused on him, not the circumstance. Remember when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, that's when he began to sink. As long as his eyes were on Jesus, he could walk on water. But when he allowed himself to be distracted by the circumstances, situations, and conditions around him, that's when he began to go down. Now, let me pull the two together. John 16, 33, in this passage. So for the believer, peace is not the absence of trials and tribulation. For the believer, peace is not the absence of suffering, persecution, pressure. Peace is not the absence of tribulation. It is the presence of trust in God. Peace for the believer is the presence of trust in God. So if you're not experiencing peace, it's because your trust is not in God. That's a tough statement, but it's so true. I'm going to say it again. So for the believer, peace is not the absence of trials and tribulation, the absence of pressure. Peace for the believer is the presence of trust in God. You can only be at peace when you have made the decision that in the face of everything you're going through, you're going to trust God. 
no matter what it feels like, looks like, smells like. I'm going to trust in God. Hallelujah. And when you truly make that decision, there's a peace that comes over you that you cannot explain. It's a peace that protects your heart, your emotions, and your mind, your thoughts. It's a peace that brings a calmness and a stillness that no matter what the future looks like, you know that God is in control of it and he always has your best interest in his heart. That's the only way you can go through. Let's look at this level of trust that Job brought. Let's go to Job chapter 13. Job chapter 13, verse 15. Job 13, 15. Job lost his family. He lost his wealth. He even lost his wife. She didn't die, but she was mentally unstable. Look, your wife's got to be mentally unstable if she tells you, why don't you curse God and die? Look at what he says. And Job got it wrong. See, we have the advantage, the privilege of reading the book and knowing that Satan was behind all of this, not God. But Job didn't have that advantage. He was living it out. So he had no idea. But he assumed if God is in control of everything, then God must be behind this. But even if it is God who's behind it, even for some reason, God may come to the conclusion that, 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 that Job had to go through this. Even if that's true, guess what? Though he slay me, I'm not going to leave the place of trust. I'm not going to give up on him. I may not understand it. I may not process it right. I may not come to the right conclusions. I may not be able to reconcile it with my knowledge of God or scripture. But even if God is behind it, I'm still going to trust him. Because trust for the believer is not the absence of trials and tribulation. Trust, peace rather, for the believer is trust in God. Your measure of peace is your measure of trust. The greater the trust, the greater the peace. The greater the trust, the greater the peace. I will tell you that there were times when we faced adversity, my wife and I, and even our ministry. I've been at this for 37 years. And I was wondering, God, are you behind all this? I mean, you get to that place where you're trying to figure it all out. And I will tell you, there's only one thing that I heard. And I know it was the Lord. He said, trust me. Trust me. You know, it's like the answer that Paul got when he went to the Lord three times, asking to be delivered from a, an, an affliction. And what was God's answer? He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul didn't like being weak. And that was more so his motivation in prayer. It wasn't so much the affliction. It was how the affliction made him look weak. And he didn't like that as part of his image. So God said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So Jesus is now sending them out. 
He's praying for them. He knows that they're still going to go through a lot of emotional changes. In fact, in chapter 16, he says, he says, you're all going to abandon me. And yet, I'm not alone. The Father is with me. And even though he knows that one is going to betray him, they're all going to abandon him, Peter's going to deny him, he still occupies this place of peace. And he utters not a word. He, uh, he occupies a place of trust in his heavenly Father. Boy, we could expand on this so much more, but I think that you get the point tonight. For us as believers, it doesn't say that God is going to just wipe all of our situations away. He requires one thing, trust. Every relationship is based on trust. And when there's trust in the relationship, the relationship is strong, the relationship is intact. Because when there is no trust in the relationship or the relationship trust is broken, there is suspicion, there's anxiety, there is fear, and all of the negative children of fear that undermine the relationship. And if there's anything the devil would like you to do, like he tried to do with Job, is to get you to stop trusting God. But tonight, the message is simple. The greater my trust, the greater my faith in him, the greater the peace that I will walk in. And peace is the central organizing factor of a Christian's life. Peace is the umpire for doing the will of God because sometimes you cannot clearly identify God's will or explain it, but you know that you're in it because there's this peace that you walk in and that's inside of you. And I will tell you, as I listen to Pastor Kong address you, as I watch the board and Aries address you on behalf of the board, I was looking for one thing to let me know that the future of this church is going to be okay because I have an apostolic responsibility to this church. I was looking for peace. And I got chills when they started singing the song, Our God is Greater. Because suddenly that peace settled inside. And I can go back to New York fully knowing it's going to be okay. City Harvest, I'm done early tonight. I love you, appreciate you, pray for you. And your latter days will be the most glorious days of the life of this ministry. God bless you. Please let's stand up and give Dr. Aaron Bernard a big clap.